So uh, thank you everyone for joining um, to our webinar on LGBTQIA plus inclusivity in science, an easy guide to pronouns, uh, organized by the EGU Pride Group. Um, the EGU Pride Group was uh, kind of founded in 2019. Um, we now have a Discord channel that we uh, meet. Uh, we organize activities. Um, we also coordinate with the EDI committee of EGU for uh, the upcoming General Assembly 24. Watch out for uh, the Pride group short course that we're organizing and also keep an eye out for other activities that are gonna appear in the program. Um, so since last year, or well, this year, um, we have the uh, very uh, important uh, news that we can actually add our pronouns on badges. And this is what inspired this webinar. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, our speakers. First, we're gonna have uh, Bene, a PhD student at ITC, University of Twente, researching the impact of sea level rise on coastlines. Uh, then we're gonna have Eli, a PhD student in the Quantum Hub, University of Birmingham, researching the application of emerging technology in hydrology. Um, the third part uh, was gonna be presented by Ray, who unfortunately cannot attend. So it's gonna be presented by Anna. Ray is a PhD student at GFZ, Potsdam, Germany. Um, their, re their research is on research in the ecological of biological community, uh, developing on Greenland ice sheet. And Hannah uh, is a postdoc at GFZ as well, researching planetary scale landscape evolution. So the outline of this uh, webinar are gonna, is gonna be about delivering three key messages as well. So the first part is what are pronouns is gonna be presented by Bene. The second part is about etiquette, how to use the pronouns presented by Ellie. And the third part is about senior day uh, presented by Ray and or actually by Anna now. So now I can uh, stop sharing and I let Bene take over. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Benno, and I will start with a quick introduction to all these letters that describe our community. So there are four letters that have to do with sexuality. These are a L for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, and the A stands for asexual. The T stands for transgender, that's related to the gender identity and is independent from sexuality. Um, Q for queer can describe both sexuality and gender is sometimes also used to describe the entire LGBT community. Um, but literally, queer actually means something like strange. Um, about 100 years ago, that was used to insult homosexual people. And only in recent decades, the word queer was reclaimed by the LGBT community. Um, but just keep in mind that, especially for older generations, that might still bring up bad memories or feelings. So the next letter is the I, that stands for intersex. Um, that's related to something we call the biological sex. Um, although even in a biological sense, there are actually more than two sexes. So what we usually mean when we describe someone as intersex is that their physical anatomy does not align with what we expect to see in a typical woman or a typical man. So when you're making yourself familiar with these terms, then please note that each of these labels also has an opposite. Um, that's important because in most parts of society, being heterosexual and cisgender and endosex and allosexual is considered to be the default. Um, everything else is the deviation from this default. Um, that makes the lives of LGBT people just harder than necessary. Um, please, under all circumstances, avoid using the word normal. Um, if you're looking for, for a very short term, um, you could, for example, use cishat as an abbreviation. But today's topic is about pronouns, and pronouns are often important to gender diverse people. So we will dive a bit deeper into the terminology around gender identity. Um, but language evolved over time, and what we consider to be respectful terminology today might not be so appropriate anymore in a few years. So please keep educating yourself. And in case of doubt, it's always the best to use the words a person asks you to use for them. So, but every person has a gender assigned at birth. 
So that means when you were born, someone, um, most often a doctor or a nurse, assigned a gender to you. And the gender is either typically, typically either male or female. So for some people, this gender assigned at birth also aligns with their gender identity. For example, someone is assigned female at birth and also feels comfortable living as a, as a woman, then we would call this person a cisgender woman. But for some people, the, the gender assigned at birth is not the same um, as the gender that they feel comfortable to live with. And at some point in their life, they might decide to, they might decide to live as the opposite gender. So a woman who was assigned male at birth is called a trans woman, and a man who was assigned female at birth is called a transgender man. So you might also sometimes encounter the term cissexual or transsexual, but over time the terminology shifted more to using cisgender and transgender to make clear that it is not about sexuality, but about gender identity. But not all trans people are male or female. So for some people, their gender identity comprises both genders, or it is somewhere in between the extremes of the gender spectrum or falls outside of the spectrum, or maybe they don't have a gender at all, or the gender fluctuates over time. So there are a lot of possibilities, and we collect these under the umbrella term non-binary. So that's not the same as being intersex, because intersex is related to the physical anatomy. So intersex people can also be cisgender, transgender, or non-binary. So very important is this, um, all these words are adjectives. So please don't refer to someone as a transgender. That's very dehumanizing and very often used by transphobic people. So use it as an adjective to describe a noun, for example, a transgender person or a cisgender person or a non-binary person. So now that we have all these adjectives to describe a person's relation to their gender assigned at birth, um, we want to talk about the pronouns because pronouns and are together with names often expressed to um, used to express uh, a person's gender identity. And as more and more people decide to change their names and pronouns, there are also more and more people apparently having problems with that. So in this example, a member from, from a headline from earlier this, this year, a member from the British Parliament said that problem pronouns are a problem. Um, they're unfact-based ideologies and apparently very dangerous for children. So there seems to be a lot of confusion, but what are pronouns, really? Um, we're going to solve this puzzle now, but you first got the opportunity to test your knowledge. So this is a short newspaper paragraph article, newspaper article paragraph um, that contains actual pronouns. And your task is now to remove the pronouns as I read it. The, the former head of a sixth form college, who is now an education advisor said, the safeguarding issues here are real. One Friday, I was working late and a kid arrived who had been really smashed up after telling their parents they were transgender. College was the only place they felt safe. He accused the government of creating an atmosphere of fear in which young people no longer felt they could turn to teachers for support. Now, this is the solution. Um, this text contains nine words that qualify as pronouns. So I guess the more obvious ones are words like he or they. But actually, words like who and which also qualify as pronouns. So in summary, or as a rule of thumb, we can say that pronouns replace nouns. And that's especially true for personal pronouns. So in this example, we are your hosts. You could also replace the we with all the names, saying Anita, Hannah, Ellie, and Bene are your hosts. But for each personal pronoun, we also have a possessive pronoun. In this example, the stage is yours. Yours is also a pronoun. And for each personal pronoun, we have a reflexive pronoun, that it is rooted with, rooted with self and selves, that refer back to a noun or pronoun that was used earlier in the sentence. In this example, kids know themselves best. So this and that are also pronouns, and the demonstrative pronouns that refer to an idea or concept. I mean, this rather infamous example, this is a result of using method X. So this is referring to something that was mentioned earlier. Um, the relative pronouns introduce a relative clause. Um, so this gives us more information about the first part of the sentence. In this example, the person who comes first gets the prize. So who refers to a person we don't know yet? Um, interrogative pronouns introduce a question. For example, what is the time? And indefinite pronouns refer to an entire group of things or people or concepts. 
So it can be something like everything is finished or also nothing is finished. So these are a lot of words, but please just remember the two main messages. So pronouns are a very important part of our language, and it seems to be a very bad idea to just remove them. But when you talk about pronouns in the context of LGBTQIA plus inclusivity, and especially gender identity, we usually mean the pronouns that refer to people in the third person, because these, these words have something to do with gender. So for example, she, he, or they, and the related possessive and reflexive pronouns. That's our new, These are the words that we're talking about here. So that's everything for me. And with that, I will hand over to Ellie. And next, we're going to talk a little bit about how to use pronouns now that we so helpfully know what they are. Um, great. So one of the first questions that we uh, commonly get, one of the first things that we start to think about when we are beginning to think about pronouns more carefully and how we're using them um, is what what do I do if I make a mistake? Uh, how do I deal with that? So we have some little little tips for just those scenarios. So the first thing is not to draw attention to the mistake that you've made. Uh, simply correct yourself immediately and carry on the conversation as normal. If you don't realise your mistake until later, make sure to go to the person that you've misgendered personally and apologise. Keep it brief, that apology is for them and it's not about you, um, and just own up to that mistake. If you're in conversation with other people and someone else makes a mistake, simply continue to use the correct pronouns for the person you're referring to throughout your conversation and then later address that individual being discussed and ask if they would like you to actively correct others using the wrong pronouns. We can try to consider starting meetings by going around the room and sharing our names and pronouns collectively. That can help people feel comfortable about using new pronouns at work. We can also begin discussions about pronouns with colleagues that we've known a long time by sharing our own pronouns and new knowledge of their use. This can kind of open that dialogue where they might share if their pronouns are different than they have been in the past. If someone is introducing themselves with new pronouns or sharing a pronoun change with you personally, um, that is not an invitation to discuss someone's gender identity in depth or, or ask any personal questions. It's best just to say thank you so much for telling me and move on with your day. So why should we be conscious of our use of pronouns, even in professional settings? Well, because having respect for our colleagues is a cornerstone to a good professional relationship. This respect extends across many areas of personal interaction, from approaching professional criticism with courtesy to addressing someone using their correct name. In order to promote, promote an environment where we can support our colleagues and work together to produce the best outcomes possible, it's important to address them in the way they ask to be addressed. A lot of allies feel like this is kind of a niche issue that doesn't affect that many people, or if it does, it doesn't really affect people that badly. Um, but we can see just from these statistics that actually that's not true. This affects quite a large number of people and can seriously impact how they feel at work and in themselves. So next, we'll talk a little bit about talking about pronouns at, at conferences, especially the EGU General Assembly. Um, so it can be really useful to get into the habit of starting that dialogue by revealing your own pronouns to anyone that you're meeting, and that helps them feel more comfortable sharing theirs. At EGU and the General Assembly, you can also check people's pronoun tags on their identification cards. So you can see there on Bene's ID, their pronouns are at the bottom. It's really important to make sure that you've either had a look at someone's identification tag and, and made sure you've checked their pronouns or asked them in person and, and simply said, would you mind sharing your pronouns uh, before you start introducing them to other people you might know.
It's really important when we're starting to talk about pronouns professionally that we're not singling anyone out. This can alienate them and make people feel really uncomfortable. The easiest way to tackle this issue is by making the culture in your working environment one where everyone is encouraged to share their pronouns, regardless of their gender or how long they've been working there. Initiating conversations about pronouns by providing your own can be a really subtle way to let new colleagues know that you're keen to respect their personal identity. It is really important to protect new colleagues from having to correct their pronouns, especially in large group settings. How can we navigate it when people might be using multiple pronouns as we're kind of starting this journey that can be a bit daunting? Um, so it's really important to not always use one or the other. Um, we need to try and get comfortable into changing two sets of pronouns when we're talking about one individual. Um, and if we're focusing so hard on that, it can be tricky not to fall into the trap of always alternating pronouns just to make sure that you're using both. Um, as you kind of become more comfortable with this, you'll find a sort of rhythm where it's not confusing and not forced either. Uh, when we meet people who prefer not to have pronouns used for them, uh, so the no pronouns tag, um, we've learned, thankfully from Benny, that actually we can just replace pronouns with proper nouns with that person's name. So we can just keep using their name when we're talking about them instead of any pronouns. And if we do meet people who are comfortable using any pronouns for themselves, um, then we just need to be sure that we're always checking with them if they're comfortable using it and its or any neo pronouns we might have heard of. Just because someone says they're comfortable or prefer any pronouns, that is not a free pass to objectify them or choose one set that you prefer for them exclusively. And with that, I'll hand on to Hannah. Uh, I'm going to take over from Ray and present their slides uh, on singular they. Uh, so as Benny and Ellie have shown, there are three commonly used pronouns in English. Uh, these are she, which is, which is typically feminine, uh, he, which, which is typically masculine, and they, which is typically neutral. Uh, this neutral singular they has been around for a while, uh, but is becoming more and more common in English language. And uh, it's also being used more and more by people who feel com more comfortable using uh, non-gendered pronouns. As this can be confusing for people who are not yet used to this, I'm going to use the next few minutes of this webinar to introduce you to the topic of Singular Day, and uh, we'll go deeper into this particular pronoun. So Singular Day, in short, is an inclusive and grammatically correct way to speak about singular gender neutral. Uh, it has a lot of advantage uh, advantages. It's inclusive, quite short, uh, much shorter than any other forms such as he or she. And it's good for people who don't identify with a specific gender or who don't want to reveal their gender. So uh, the usage of singular they is actually also accepted and encouraged by uh, the New Oxford Dictionary and Merriam-Webster. So uh, it is definitely a correct pronoun to be used in, in the English language. And it also has a fairly long history. So singular they as a pronoun has been in use in the English language since the 14th century. One of the earliest recording recorded usages is in a medieval poem, uh, William and the Werewolf from 1375. Uh, this has also been used uh, in by many English writers such as Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Jane Austen. And Shakespeare was supposedly quite, quite uh, he quite liked to use the form singular they, and so you see it in quite a lot of plays. For example, here, there's not a man I meet, but does salute me as if I were their well-acquainted friend uh, from a comedy of errors. There was some controversy arose in the 18th century about the use of singular they, uh, but that didn't stop Jane Austen from using singular they uh, during the 18th century. So if we look more now at the usage of singular they, we can see the versatility and the benefits of using singular they in various examples. So uh, the first example, one of the new students needs help. Would you please help them? This is useful if you're unaware of the gender of the new student. 
uh, or if you're unsure of the gender of the new student. This person gave us permission to share their work. They specify details that we should consider. This is useful if you want to potentially con conceal the identity of the person sharing the work, uh, or you don't feel it's relevant. Tam submitted their thesis today. In this example, Tam uses they, them pronouns. My partner is coming today. I saved a spot for them. My partner is uh, becoming a more popular usage of uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, or husband, wife, uh, spouse being another equivalent. And uh, essentially, this is a good usage for when uh, you don't feel that the gender of your partner is relevant. You don't feel comfortable revealing the gender of your partner, or you don't feel that it's necessary in the conversation to reveal the gender of your partner. Uh, finally, oh, this computer has been here for hours. Have you seen Tam? I think it's theirs. This is another example of a person using uh, they, them as pronouns. So in terms of the grammar of they, them, Ben has already covered uh, some of the grammar, but I will go specifically onto they, and it's used in the same way as you with a plural conjugation. So for instance, he or she is, you are, and they are, this was some this was where some of the controversy arose because singular should have is as a as a conjugation not are and actually some usages of the singular they do actually use is however it's uncommon but they are is still grammatically correct and so it's perfectly fine to use that uh, he or she does and you do and they do uh, with the incorrect version being you does and they does so you and they have the same conjugations but they is still singular and you can also be singular. Themselves is used, uh, but themselves uh, is also a, 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 a pronunciation or a spelling. And both usages are commonly accepted, generally with the divergence being between American English and British English. So there are other gender neutral pronouns and one's assumption would be that potentially the usage of it could be a, a gender neutral version of a pronoun. Um, but the thing with, with the it pronoun uh, is it's historically used for inanimate objects or animals. So referring to somebody as it, if they explicitly did not give you permission to do so, is quite dehumanizing and also can be quite disrespectful. Some people do prefer to use the pronouns it, but only if they specifically ask you to use those pronouns, should you use it for a human. Uh, this rule is also the case with the German neuter pronoun, where it's not common to use it as a personal pronoun. There's also another alternative, which is neopronouns. Neopronouns have become a lot more popular in recent years as a way to explore one's gender identity and question gender society. And they're often based on nouns. So they can be a little bit confusing. Uh, if you have any uncertainty about how to pronounce them or how to use them, then ask the person who's using the neopronouns. They will be able to advise you best. So over time, languages and in particular words have changed to better reflect modern use. This is how languages naturally evolve and how uh, languages change to better fit modern uh, society. So when referring to a vehicle, uh, such as a rocket or a boat that is capable of transporting human passengers, the old terminology was manned. This was perfectly acceptable because uh, in many, uh, in many early, early, in early periods, it was actually not allowed for women to, to go on boats. And so nowadays, this is obviously not the case. Uh, the new terminology better reflects the gender diversity of the crew. And so we use the word crude. The terminology for man is, is falling out of fashion because crude better fits. And, and not only this, but young generations have been creating more universal, more inclusive forms that are now commonly used in languages that historically did not have a neutral. So English has the benefit of having this, this they as a neutral pronoun, which can be uh, used as a singular pronoun, but other languages do not have this. And some languages still need some time to adapt. Romance languages in particular are being very heavily gendered. In French, there is actually an example, and I won't subject you to French pronunciation, so uh, please just uh, read that as it is. Um, but a, a romance language I'm more familiar with is Portuguese. And this obviously has a masculine and a feminine, but there is still discussion about what, how to include a neutral pronoun. Uh, there isn't actually a neutral pronoun in Portuguese. There is, however, a workaround. And this is just to not use the gender term. Uh, this is not perfect, but it works for now. 
And uh, essentially the example I'm going to show you just quickly is I'm going for lunch with Sam today. Sam does not have, uh, Sam uses uh, non-binary pronouns or does not prefer to be referred with male or female pronouns. So the example would be vu almosar kom Sam oj. I'm going for lunch with Sam today. You're removing the O and the A to make the sentence genderless. From a grammatic point of view, this is incorrect. But as we've seen with language evolution, potentially this could be accepted as correct Portuguese at some point in the future. So the key takeaways of Ray's part, which hopefully I've given uh, effectively, and Bene and Ellie's part is uh, respect each person's pronouns. Uh, if a person tells you their pronouns, respect them and also respect when and where to use them, as this may change, as Ellie's mentioned. Always strive to be more inclusive. The inclusivity is, is a matter of respect and, and making sure that you have a, a workplace environment that is good for everybody. Um, so please be respective of your colleagues and inclusive towards all your colleagues. Uh, be aware of the singular they as a short and practical pronoun to use that is grammatically correct. Uh, so try to include this in your uh, grammar moving forward. And mistakes do happen. So if you do make a mistake, make a mistake, Ellie has has helped you with this. Uh, be accepting of yourself and of others, and and always keep trying to improve yourself and the people around you and the environment around you. So I'm gonna paste a link to a glossary of terms in the description, and uh, I will remain uh, as the, the the speaker to distribute and answer questions and also begin discussion. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed. Anonymous attendee has said, uh, hi, thanks for the webinar. Do you recommend that everyone in an organization start using pronouns in their email signature at the same time? If so, how would you encourage this change? Um, I think, Ellie, would you like to take over this one? Because this was part of your presentation. Um, so we can, we can answer this live and uh, go ahead, please. Uh, sure, I can give it my best shot. <laughs> um, I think the key take key point the key take home message hopefully is that if you as an individual can promote that um kind of atmosphere of change promote that inclusive environment um and maybe that is by just changing your email signature so that your pronouns are in it maybe that is by talking to your colleagues supervisor boss um about how we could maybe include that in your culture um that that could be helpful i think change does start with one person but it, it will kind of depend a little bit on on your particular situation and how comfortable you feel bringing that up i think it's important to show support and uh big organization gathering nine more than 19,000 scientists it's actually also a good opportunity to get the conversation about pronouns and not only about so also uh, inclusivity uh, into maybe institutions and countries where um, maybe uh, the the rules are different or the the use is different so it's kind of a way to also show support uh, in places where people are still maybe less supported than others. So I mean, a general assembly, I think, is a great way to start like uh, an example, if you want. Bennett, do you want to uh, say something else? Uh, yes, I, I think it's actually a nice idea to bring this on an organizational level. Um, like, in, like that an organization encourages their employees um, to, to get used to using pronouns. But I think it's it's very hard to to actually Im implement this. I mean, organizations could start maybe using, like, encouraged to use pronouns, for example, in Zoom meetings or in other, like, chat chat groups. Like, in my organization, we're using Teams. Um, I'm sure you could also, like, add the pronouns at the end of the name, but um, that would lead to a lot of discussions with, like, HR people. So I think the easiest way is still for individuals to just live the way they 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 want to live and encourage others by this way of living to do to do the same 
Uh, we have some other questions. Uh, the next one is from Joanna Beja. And I, I would actually like to answer this one. I think it's addressed towards me more than anything. Uh, Hi, Hannah, I'm Portuguese, and I've seen some information on genderless pronouns that we could adopt in our language. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. I found a website which provides a summary, but I don't think it's been officially implemented. This is really cool. I didn't actually know about this. So I'm very much still learning Portuguese. I did my PhD in Portugal, so I, I'm you know by no means fluent. And you know, I would still say I'm kind of in A levels, but I, I don't really know the levels particularly well because I never formally learned Portuguese. I've just kind of immersed myself. Um, but that's really cool. Uh, I'm really I'm really glad to see that there's movements in Portuguese to produce a gender neutral pronoun. And I'll read about that uh, more. And um, I suppose it would be okay to paste that in the chat. Uh, so that everybody else can see it, if that's okay. Um, is that okay? Oh, there we go. Simon has now pasted it. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you. I guess I should have done uh, more research, <laughs> but thank you very much for bringing that to everyone's attention. Uh, so the next question is from Tom uh, Bugert. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, when making pronouns a standard part of an introduction round, isn't there a chance of putting your non-binary colleague on the spot to out themselves? This is a very good question. And uh, I think that that well, Bene looks like that the, they've jumped in. Bene, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, sorry, I, I misclicked a bit. But oh, OK. Yes. Well, now, you, now you're going <laughs> to get <no>. punished. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually wanted to ask this question, but I think on another <laughs> question. OK, so um, I think that's, that's a very good point. Um, but you have to say when you're introducing yourself with your name, um, so in a way, like when you're when you're introducing yourself with your name and your pronouns, um, if you're still not out and you're using your dad name and also the pronouns that belong to your dad name, um, yeah, it's it's both hurtful. But yes, when you're not out, like not being out is is a, is a hurtful thing to to be. Um, but at least it would encourage to to, to use to people to use pronouns and also like it sends the message. Whatever pronouns you got, you want to use me. I'm going to use it for you. Like I, I think introducing oneself with pronouns sends the message. I'm going to respect your pronouns. Um, but yes, it's it's a difficult topic. I agree. But it might be it might cause people to to get hurt. But you get hurt all the time in daily life when people talk about you. So I think it would still be a, a step forward. Are there other, other opinions? <laughs> Yeah, I just I would like to maybe add some more to that. So I think that the, this question also comes to the discussion of if you have a person at work who's closeted, uh, who they 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 know that they themselves are trans, but they don't feel comfortable um, socially transitioning or physically transitioning at that point for various reasons. I won't go into, but essentially that then you're forcing them to use a pronoun that they themselves don't identify with personally. But I think from a point of view of no pronouns being included in discussion to pronouns being included would make them feel more open to, uh, would make them feel more comfortable with the social transition when they were ready to do it. So yes, of course, they would then be forced to use the pronouns that they don't identify with uh, personally and that they use outwardly whilst closeted, but then they are aware that the discussion around pronouns is there in their office, in their workplace. And so would probably feel less awkward about going around saying, oh, by the way, I'm changing my pronouns now, uh, because that's obviously a huge component of social transition for, for trans people and non-binary people is, is actually making this discussion. For most people, it's bringing it up first and then saying it. So by bringing it up before anything in, a, in a, you know, a, an office-based environment, you don't then have to put the onus on the, the trans person or the non-binary person to bring up the discussion and then socially transition as well. I think that that's something else to consider. Um, does anyone else have any comments? Maybe I do. I think it's something that was uh, mentioned uh, earlier. A good way is probably just to ask in advance if, you know, if the person feels comfortable or not at some point or like just, just showing uh, your support, like, it, I think it will maybe make uh, people more comfortable, but uh, it's their place, their time, not yours. So just try to be respectful. 
So um, this is from uh, Angel Muniz Piniella. I hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, hello, is there a disrespectful way to ask pronouns of our participants at the registration form for an event? Or just asking directly is fine, name, surname, pronouns, email, etc. cetera. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a discussion that we've been having in the EGU Pride group of how to deal with, uh, how to discuss this with EGU potentially in the future. Uh, obviously the addition of pronouns in the registration was a big step and, and whether or not that needs to be edited or changed is um, something that we're, we're onwardly discussing. Uh, Anita, would you like to comment on this? So it's, like the formal recognition, when you see the registration form that you're asked, it's a sign that somebody has worked toward in trying to include the pronouns. If you obviously see more option than, than he or, or she, obviously. And the formal part takes work, um, takes conscience and uh, in several formal fo forms, of registration for an event or even at your, I don't know, office, or it's um, it's a sign that something is not happening when you only have the binary option. So I think to answer it in a short way, I think it's not disrespectful to put in a form and ask formally to a person. One thing perhaps to consider is also to leave the option to not disclose um the, the you know you ask not uh, prefer not to say i think the formula is and um, it's important to leave that formula open although in the recent times for instance when it was with the general assembly went from being uh, live like in person only and then he moved to virtual when it was just virtual in 2000 in 2020 sorry uh several people uh, actually then identified. So the, the the percentage of people prefer not to say were, was much higher in person conferences, whereas in, in the hybrid format or, or in the um, online format, people would feel more free to disclose their pronouns. And so it, I think there are ways to make it too inclusive and a ways to include the choice, make the people choose what they want to identify and if they want. Thank you. So we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for the webinar. Many of us work in environments where English is not the person's first language. So the more binary he, she is more often used when talking about someone of an unknown gender. How would you facilitate the switch from that to the more inclusive they? Um, so, I'm not sure who to ask for this one, actually. Who would like to answer this one? I would suggest to just use it as much as you can and hope that people will pick up on it because everything else, like, like again, going on an organizational level and saying, um, please, instead of using he, she, now only use they, um, can feel for some people to be, to get a language forced upon them. So that can, again, lead to discussions. Um, they are, I would suggest to just use it all the time. I will comment too uh, that that yeah that that using they is 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 generally. I mean, I again, I sound like I'm preaching a little bit, but it's it's a much uh, shorter and and less clunky way to to use this kind of term if you unknown if the person has an unknown gender or particularly uh, one example was was uh, somebody was was giving instructions for a lab when I was in my masters. And they were saying he or she then needs to do this. He or she then needs to prepare the sample in this way. He or she then should do this. And and the amount of he or she's that were said uh, it extended the the, ter the tutorial by maybe five minutes. So just for the person to say they or then the you know researcher, uh, the scientist, the lab attendant, the student, uh, you can also replace these with nouns, like Bene said, if you're unsure of the gender and you're even unsure of using they, you can you can also replace them with nouns. But but from a grammatical point of view, uh, they is, is not only the more inclusive form, but it's also the more grammatically correct form in those kind of usages, at least. If maybe I can add something, because in the question there was 
uh, another, I think, important uh, discussion point, which was about uh, different languages and obviously in Ray's, uh, Hannah's part of the webinar, it was kind of touched upon, but I think it's it's some in some languages it's really really difficult to move away from the binary pronouns and it's because it's not embedded in the language as it is in English. In English it's really easy and yet people struggle. And so imagining Italian, French, as you said, Portuguese, it's really really hard. But there are resources now. We found out one from Portuguese from Portuguese language. I'm sure there are resources people are thinking about it and probably there are resources out there that I recommend we all search and learn and as we also said uh, it's it's kind of in language is in continuous evolution and the way we want to kind of make the effort to get ourselves informed and our workplace informed um, maybe in a way to inform your own workplaces organizing a webinar similar to this one but maybe focused on something that Maybe it's more your own language. Um, I don't know. Um, it's not that you can force um, upon, but I think it's really important to talk about it and make it a habit. If there wasn't any more questions, uh, there was a discussion that I would like to raise because I think this might be another useful thing to mention. Uh, actually, we do have one other quick question uh, from Angel Moniz again at Pinella. Uh, how were the pronouns used at the panels, debates, presentations during the EGU event or other events? Were the moderators aware of this additional information to introduce address panelists? Who communi cu communicated this to the moderator? Anita? I feel like I could uh, try and answer this question, which is very, very important. The um, So it's not the rule. Uh, it's more of a best practices that uh, we're also working on and perhaps is already active in other conferences. So one way uh, is to, before the debate or the panel or the scientific session starts, is a very good habit to go to each speaker and ask perhaps for pronouns and especially uh, also pronunciation. As I'm from Italy, I will just struggle pronouncing some Name day is difficult, and I also received many times, how do you pronounce your surname and your name? So it's not only beneficial to treat the person with the right and address the person with the right pronouns, it's also the right way to recognize and try and pronounce their names, their names in the best way you can. We all understand that the, our pronunciation is, is difficult um, or different, for sure. But the effort of going first before the session starts is better than just assuming a pronoun, assuming how the name is pronounced. Then you do your best. You can get it wrong, and as we said in the in the in this webinar, it's okay to get it wrong. Uh, but um, it's a good effort and best practices that uh, that we we all try and implement uh, while convening a session, for instance. Thank you. We have another anonymous question. Thank you everybody for, for all the questions. These have all been really great. Uh, so if I don't know the pronouns of the person I'm talking about, I often use they, them. And this is also partly due to being a native speaker of a gender neutral language. I often wonder if this is disrespectful to some and would like to hear your input on this. Um, so uh, I kind of, I'm kind of curious, uh, Ellie, would you like to, yeah, would you like to pitch in? Like super quickly, I think others will have more interesting viewpoints, especially talking about other languages. Um, but just as a native English speaker, like Hannah slash Ray told us that using they them for someone you don't know the the pronouns for is fine. Um, and obviously the key thing is I, I don't think that's disrespectful. I think it's disrespectful if you continue to use they them if they tell you they prefer something else. That's it. You just have to make sure that once you know the correct ones, you're using those. But obviously, if if someone is a native speaker of another language where they them isn't isn't an option, they might find that disrespectful. I I don't know. Anne, would you like to comment? I cannot imagine that anyone thinks it's disrespectful. Um, 
it would be more disrespectful if you would assume a gendered pronoun, I, I'd say. So using an ungendered pronoun is in, in an unknown situation is the most respectful thing you can do. But yeah, as Ali said, like if someone asks you to use another set of pronouns, of course, use this set of pronouns. Um, I can somehow understand this question because um, I identify male, but I still prefer they pronouns because I would like to encourage the use of they pronouns for more people. Um, so I'm also sometimes wondering if if someone um, identity, identifies female and I accident, accidentally call them a day person, um, could they be angry at me? So I sort of understand this question, but um, I still think using they is much better than assuming he or she just on, on the appearance. Yeah, I think as a general rule of thumb, don't assume pronouns from outward appearance. Use they them as a default if you're unsure and then clarify with the person at a later point in, in a you know kind of private in, environment. Uh, as Ellie said, best or not, kind of, you know, you there, what's your pronouns in, an, in a kind of public area? Uh, so thank you very much for the question. Um, so, so another comment, another discussion I would like to raise, because I think this is also relevant to the, to the discussion, um, is, is a, a question that we, we've come up with ourselves to discuss uh, with everybody. So a, a colleague or a student or a, a member of the lab at, at my workplace has changed their name and pronouns. And I'm really curious about the whole thing, uh, but also scared to say something wrong. What questions are appropriate and what questions are inappropriate to ask that person? So um, it's so hard to answer. There's there's no short answer. Well, OK, there's a short answer, but not an easy answer. The short answer is you can ask the same questions that you would ask a cis person in the same situation. There's not the one inappropriate question or the one appropriate question. Every question can be appropriate or inappropriate. Like this, this very infamous question about what do you have on your pants is super inappropriate in, in a workplace work situation, but might maybe even be appropriate in a sort of dating situation, like who knows? Um that in a in a workplace situation, yeah. Usually if you if you don't have like a friend like of, of relationship to someone, um you, you should not discuss the, the gender in more detail. I I, I would not suggest so. Um, this person just wants you to inform about their pronouns and um, does not want to discuss all, all the details related to, to gender identity with you. Um, this person has no, no um, how do you say, um, it, it's not obliged to, to answer all your questions. Like if you're really super curious, then please go to the internet. Um, everything is out there that you want to know. There are people who, who talk about it, who write about it. Um, there's this, I, I like, yeah, I'd say there's, there's no answer that you cannot find out there. Um, please don't force your colleague to give you this information. The onus is not on your colleague to educate you about issues that you're unsure of. And yeah, it, it's, I think general best practices, don't ask personal questions. And um, further related to this, I think it's, it can be sometimes a uh, unsure of how to to deal with somebody if, if they're socially transitioning at work if they present in one gender and then start to slowly uh look uh, physically different or dress physically dress differently to what their assigned gender is and um, do not don't try not to bring attention to it and, and let the person uh you know get to these checkpoints as they feel fit and tell you as they feel fit so so that's the kind of best practice if you're unsure as ben i said there is a lot of resources online of how to deal with this, how to support your non-binary and trans colleagues in every way, and to make your workplace more uh, accepting and supportive for these people and for everyone in general, uh, just to make a less uh, hostile work environment, a more accepting work environment, more inclusive work environment. So um, with that, we will probably start wrapping up. Um, Anita, did you have any final comments? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Hannah, Ben and Eli. Thank you very much for the uh, webinar. We hope it's a resource that people can go back to. And we, when we implemented the pronouns on the General Assembly badges, we had several questions about it and several comments that of people curious, of people not understanding why it's important. I hope that by attending this 
uh, webinar or view the recording of it, people can um, can get some clarification. Otherwise, uh, everybody's welcome to join our events uh, during the General Assembly or come find us at the EDI booth. And uh, with that, uh, I will thank you, everybody, and um, see you soon. Thank you very much.